Hello, come in. Hello, come in. Nice to see you. You, you find me at home at last. You're lucky to do so, actually, because I've just been ridiculous the last um, couple of weeks. Uh, I've been away in the States and back here and then away in Oxford and then and then up on my holiday in, um, in Northumberland. I just had a week, which was lovely, and little gidding and... But I'm back now, but about to go off to the States again to do a thing with um, the painter Bruce Herman and the composer Jack Redford, uh, our Ordinary Saints project. So anyway, you found me at home, which is great. And um, <clears throat> last time, of course, I was in, in Nashville in Phil Kiggy's studio, and uh, that's the beginning of a project I'll tell you more about later. But of course, since... You last came to see me when I was over in Nashville. That was just before I flew back. And, of course, that was the day I had the news that uh, Her Late Majesty the Queen had, had died and uh, and gone to her reward in heaven. And um, it was a moment of um, grief and yet uh, joy for her after such a long life so well lived. And it's been a great time of transition but also of drawing together of kind of recovering our identity I think in some ways as a nation in and through her as our figurehead as I mean she was um, a servant queen uh, she was somebody who really understood sovereignty as service and of course that's a distinctly Christian idea the idea that Jesus gave the disciples when he said, you call me Lord and Master, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But if I wash your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I am come among you as one who serves. And the Queen had a very distinct sense of that. One of the things we all did as a nation together when we were re recovering from this news and responding to it was we watched again, it was shown again and again on TV, the astonishing speech, the vow, the, the kind of moment of dedication that the Queen made when she was 21, promising to serve the nation and the Commonwealth. And uh, she kept that vow magnificently in the 70 years of her reign. And of course, most of us have known no one else. I was born in 1957. She was already on the throne. And she was... Um, a really remarkable person. Um, the more you look at her life, the more extraordinary becomes the, the dedication she had. But she knew that by promising to serve us, she would also be serving Christ. She knew that Christ had said that we should be servants of one another and that in serving one another, we would serve him. Whatsoever you do for the least of these, you do for me. And, of course, she was anointed in a very specifically kind of Christian moment, chrism of anointing. That's where the word Christ comes from. She was anointed in a moment of, of intimate prayer uh, in Westminster Abbey, shrouded, as it were, by cloth, so that it could just be her and God and the Archbishop's anointing. Um, and she, she fulfilled her vows and... Uh, you know, in the midst of our grief at losing her, we could also have some sense of those words of Christ, you know, well done, thou good and trusty servant. And uh, so we've learnt to change our anthem and to sing God Save the King, and, and I think we can have very good hopes in in King Charles III, uh, who's been trained for this all his life and has set before him clearly and explicitly in his message to the nation, the example of his mother. So... Um, We've all been coming to terms with that and Maggie and I were up in the north on the day of the funeral and what a day that was. Uh, all the queuing to see her lying in state and then everybody together, not just in our nation but across the Commonwealth and across the world, as we, we did those essential things that are there in a funeral. I, I was asked to speak about the funeral on, on BBC Radio and um, I wanted to emphasise that it had in it the same elements of every Christian funeral that it is a thanksgiving to God for the gift of this person and for their life, a remembering of them, a holding them up to the light and up to God. But then also it's a letting go. It's letting somebody go into God, letting them return to their maker and see him face to face. And then it's a resolution to learn from her life and to move on. And those are the elements of 
of any Christian funeral. Anyway, we've just got back from our time in the North and uh, just catching up. I'm about to go off to the States again, but uh, one of the things I've been catching up on is uh, our copies of the Church Times, which is the weekly uh, paper that the, the, the Church of England has. And this, is a, this one is from the 16th of September, so it's during the lying in state, but before the funeral. And there you see the astonishing, the, the, um, the catafalque with the royal standard uh, covering uh, the, the coffin on the catafalque. And then above on the coffin, this wreath of flowers from her gardens and the crown, the crown with its cross, the crown laid aside with a cross above the world there, uh, laid aside, the majesty laid aside as, of course, in coming to save us, Christ laid aside his majesty. Um, and it's been really, it's actually, you know, it's kind of one you'd want to keep and show your grandchildren. So cathedrals and parishes stay open for prayer. Abbey prepares for state funeral. And then um, King at Thanksgiving service. And then there's a wonderful long editorial. Leaders honour a faithful Christian disciple. And that's what she was. Anyway, having shown you this special issue of the Church Times, I thought, just while you're here, <coughs> I might read you the piece that I had in this same issue. Uh, as you know, I write, write this Poets' Corner column. And um, it happened that reading through the Psalms in this extraordinary period of transition between the Queen's death and the great funeral, and of course the longer period of transition between that letting go of her and our receiving in a deeper and more fully symbolic way uh, Charles as our new sovereign, which will be the coronation whenever that happens, perhaps sometime next year. It happened that I was reading <coughs> Psalm 21, which is a great coronation psalm and speaks of a golden crown. But of course, 21 comes before 22. And 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's about the crown of thorns. Anyway, I wrote a piece in which I included my poem from David's crown about about um, Psalm 21. And I thought perhaps it might just be fitting. I know you were asking me for my response to this this great event in our lives and the loss of Her Majesty, and I've given you something of that. But perhaps I can't give it better than reading the piece <clears throat> that was published in this particular uh, uh, memorable edition of the Church Times. So they've titled it, As Malcolm Guite Pondered a Time of Transition, He Found the Great Coronation Psalm. And here's what I wrote. I was away in America when I heard news of the Queen's death, and tears came to my eyes for the loss of someone whom I had never met yet had been an unfailing presence, a reassurance, and an example of servant leadership for the whole of my life. I was relieved to know that I would be flying home that very evening, and that I would soon have my feet on the soil over which she was sovereign, and among the people she loved and served, who would know and share my grief. So I was at home not only to witness the mourning and the many beautiful recollections and remembrances of her long and fruitful reign, but also His Majesty's moving address to the nation, the first singing of God Save the King, and the formal pro proclamation of our new sovereign. Even as these great occasions of state are celebrated, the ordinary life of the church and the nation goes on, but its very routines are sometimes lifted into a new light by this time of transition. So it was that in my usual journey through the Psalter I came to Psalm 21, often referred to as a coronation psalm. <clears throat> these lines from Psalm 21. The king shall rejoice in thy strength, O Lord. Exceeding glad shall he be of thy salvation. Thou hast given him his heart's desire and hast not denied him the request of his lips. For thou shalt prevent him with the blessings of goodness and shalt set a crown of pure gold upon his head. As I read it, I felt this psalm shimmering into new significance. Early Christians applied it to Christ, the son of David, and therefore the understanding of coronation itself deepened. Before he wears the golden crown prophesied in this psalm, Christ, the true Messiah, comes to suffer with his creation and to wear the crown of thorns, the corona spinia, as it was called in Latin. For the word corona, which we have learned to dread, is there 
in the word coronation and is surely part of Christ's corona spinia. For he enters into our suffering that we might enter into his glory. Turning back to my response to this psalm in David's crown, I felt that this poem might serve as a prayer and a blessing for these days between the grief of parting and the consolation of a new coronation. So here's the poem. Now may you find in Christ riches and rest. May you be blessed in him and he in you in heaven, where to grant you your request is always blessing, for your heart is true, true to yourself and true to Christ your King. Breathe through this coronation psalm and view the glory of his golden crown. Then sing the exaltation, goodness, life and power the blessing and salvation Christ will bring. But first, he wears a darker crown. The hour is coming and has come. Our Lord comes down into the heart of all our hurts to wear the sharp corona spinia, crown of thorns, and to descend with us to death before he shares with us the golden crown. So, that was my contribution to this. Anyway, thank you for calling round. I shall be uh, uh, jetting off to the States uh, in a couple of days, but I hope we'll catch up with one another soon. Good to see you again.